Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Overseas Famous Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Owens. Overseas Famous is sponsored by Loop Mogul, an influencer-led sports metaverse gaming platform powered by exclusive properties, NFTs, and token rewards for the fans and business community. Play against your favorite athletes and influencers at Loop Mogul. Great show today. I am joined by Travis Diener. And John, welcome. John uh, has written a book. Uh, he has written several books. Uh, the first book being uh, the Walk On Warrior, which is John's story as a walk on at Marquette. And he has just written a book, No Fear in the Arena, which takes us through Travis Diener's life uh, and how he became the NBA player, the the superstar at Marquette. So welcome, guys. It's very cool. It's John. I know your story. I wrote a book, uh, kind of my story of over playing overseas. I think you writing a book on yourself is a lot easier than writing a book on someone else. So, was that a difficult process to kind of be like, all right, you know, Travis, you guys obviously played together. You were teammates, and I'm going to kind of get into that relationship. Was that something that was difficult to be like, all right, I want to write a book about you? Was that phone call, you know, an interesting one or was it just like, all right, let's do this? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first time around, I, I never thought my first book would be a real book. You know, I think it was a lot of us, we had these stories in our heads or we, you know, recall maybe memories that were meaningful to us. And, you know, we think, hey, maybe I'll put this together and give it to my my two girls someday. Um, but my wife was actually in a medical residency and anyone that's been through that, basically you don't see her for, for weeks at a time. So I thought I could, uh, you know, watch hundreds of NBA games this year, or I could like buckle down and do something that was meaningful to me, um, uh, kind of in the evening. So, um, that's ultimately what pushed me over the edge to get walk on warrior actually like out to the public. And I think, as you know, writing your own book, it's, uh, it's a grind. It's also a decision of like, what do you want to tell? And how much, you know, how much of your personal life do you want to put out into kind of the public, public eye? Um, so there's a lot of back and forth on that, just in terms of the stories you, I wanted to tell and what I thought, you know, people would actually relate to. And then going back to your question, I think it's absolutely harder. I mean, I've got hundreds of stories about myself, but as a, as a writer, you know, I didn't want to not do justice to, to just the reality of Travis's stories and the things that actually happened, I think one of the things we took a lot of pride in was, was getting it right. Um, if I wasn't sure on something I'd ask. And what we did is we kind of pivoted about halfway through and we said, this story is going to be so much more interesting if we interview a bunch of people about Travis. So we talked to college teammates. We talked to our college coach, Tom Crean. We talked to um, some former NBA guys and, and coaches. And so just to get all these perspectives and to hear people's enthusiasm as they recalled some of these stories or, you know, moments in the locker room or tough games, you know, that's, that's the good stuff. And that's ultimately what we wanted to kind of put into the book. John, you have a great story about how coach Crink walked into the locker room and made you stand up and screamed at your screamed at you and like almost embarrassed you saying you weren't, you were like messing around a practice. You weren't doing everything. And as a player, you're like, what the fuck? But like, as a coach, I, it's kind of one of those things where you're like, okay, I see what he's doing there. Like I can, you can kind of step away from that moment and be like, all right, he's sh trying to show that he's not just yelling. He's yelling at everyone, like everyone from the bottom to the top, every, you know, athlete on the team, every, you know, manager, trainer, everything, it all works together to create that teamwork, which was the point he was trying to get, but it's pretty hilarious <laughs> when you're in that moment. As a player, you're just kind of like, dude, seriously, like I'm grinding every single day. I'm coming to practice every single day. And I'm, you know, not getting all of the minutes that you, you're you're just working your ass off every single day. And then you get a coach who just kind of you know lays into you. Was that something you were just like, this sucks? Or were you did you kind of take that with what as you kind of see it now? Was that something you just kind of said, you know what? I understand why he's doing this. Yeah, I think one of the awesome parts about the first book was that I wrote some of that stuff when I was 18, 19 years old. And then when I went back to look at it when I was 33, 34, I was like, 
did I really feel that way? Like, did it happen like that? <laughs> um, but I purposely didn't go back and change some of that. I think that was what was cool about that book was that there were obviously a lot of things that when you're 19, you look at it and then you're like, yeah, this is ridiculous. But when you're 33, it absolutely makes sense. It's like, hey, this guy valued my contributions. Um, it it mattered, like the way I showed up to practice, even if I didn't play a minute in the game. And that was kind of the mentality of the team. So um, I absolutely understand as a coach what he was trying to do. And I think that's just what's what's funny as you age, is there's so yeah. many things you look back on and you're like, probably wouldn't act it that way now, or I handled myself poorly. But I guess that's ultimately comes with, with age and some wisdom. Absolutely. And looking back at your relationship, I know when I was at Monmouth, one of my closest friends to this day is, was a walk-on who uh, almost settled me down. I feel like when you get into those big games and you're so focused and you're overly focused on what you have to do, to just have a teammate come up and, and just be like, you suck, or just say something that makes you laugh before the game was so reassuring to me. And that was my my boy, Tim. Did you guys have a relationship where you guys were able to kind of bring yourselves up and, and knock yourselves back down so you can kind of be level-headed and have that balance when you're going into a game? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Travis can, can speak to this, but, you know, Travis was an unbelievable player at that time. You know, he was arguably probably one of the top five, if not three college basketball players in the country. So, you know, Travis didn't meet, need my help to go and play well. <laughs> the games. Um, but I think, you know, what's interesting is that when you're around someone like, like Travis on a daily basis, you're just, the level of everything goes up. And I think that's one of the kind of the central threads in this book is that you have so many people out there that think they work hard or, you know, I'm better than everybody else at this until you actually get to be around somebody that's playing at just an incredibly higher level than you're used to. And it just raises the bar for everybody. And I think, um, you know, you look at Marquette's success before I was there and, and making it to a final four and the success that they had, you know, even years after that, um, you know, it starts with a leader and sometimes that leader is the coach, but oftentimes the leader is your best player. And in Travis's case, obviously like, you know, we had some some young big men that were kind of forced to play just because we had some injuries and um, they probably played more than they should have, but they played a lot better than I think they probably even thought that they could at that age and given their their lack of experience just because it was like the bar's here and um, you can't make these, you know, freshman mistakes anymore. So after you did it a couple of times, you know, it was everybody had to kind of kind of up their game to get to where we needed to be. Travis, take us through that leadership that you exhibited at Marquette, because a lot of people, when you're that young, I mean, 18 to 22, it's it's hard to, to really develop that leadership and then being able to take that with you into the NBA. But at Marquette, how were you able to develop that leadership? Was something, was it a coach relationship or was it just something that you just developed over time and you were like, you know what, I got this, like, let's, let's go everyone follow me. We're, we're taking this. Well, I think naturally uh, from a very young age, I had a, uh, I would say a belief in my ability to, to perform. So I think, you know, playing with a lot of confidence, uh, teammates can sense that and, and the belief in, in what I could do. And I was very hard on myself and I was very hard on my teammates, but I think they always knew that, you know, it was coming from the right place. It wasn't coming out of, selfishness or um you know i'm just looking out for myself it, it came from you know if, if we win if we do well everyone will will feel that reward and, and the, you know the fruits of the labor and so i was always a very vocal leader I, i've been around guys that are more you know going to practice lead by example and that works too and i think you know being a point guard helps you know you're you're the extension of the head coach I had a very close uh relationship with coach Crean. I, th I think I understood what he wanted out of our team and not to say it wasn't extremely hard be between me and him at times, but I think I got a, a pretty good idea of what was expected at a, at a very young age, uh, growing up in a basketball family, then, you know, going to Marquette of, of, you know, here are the expectations, uh, 
for yourself and here are the expectations for, for your team. So I think a lot of the leadership stuff just came natural and, you know, will to try to, you know, try to win. I think ultimately, you know, and I think it's stated in the book is, you know, sports and basketball in general is, is pretty black and white. Either you win or you lose. And I, I, I just never understood putting in all this work and not being totally driven to try to win. And uh, I never could, re- it never resonated with me when, when guys or, or teammates of mine didn't care as, didn't care as much as I did. And I, and that's, that's not reality either. And that's naive on my part, but it just didn't, un- I, it, I tried to un- make it understand in my mind and it, it never really, it never really entered that way. That's a great thought into the mentality because it is a tough, it's tough when you're giving everything you have and you're looking around and being like, why aren't you? And we, there's a ton of stories about, you know, great NBA players who thought the same way. And when you make it to the NBA, you would think that everyone would have that mentality because you're in the greatest league in the world. And it's not always the case. And kind of comparing the two, college and pro, obviously the money is huge. <laughs> it's obviously you're at the top level of basketball. So there is that sense of just like, I made it, I'm here. How would you compare the two, uh, all you know, on the court when you're talking about you know the practices, when you're talking about the games, is it the the level not only change but the the work ethic needed to stick around? How does that compare between college and pro? Yeah, I mean, in, in college, it's you know you are you're there and you're there to play basketball and you're there. I mean, this is 20 years ago. It's, it's, I think it's a different landscape than it is now, but you know, the, the coach is going to say something, you're going to do it. And you don't know any better. Uh, you're coming there with your eyes wide open and you know, whatever's being told to you, that's what you're doing. And you're trying to give your best effort. Now, when you get to the NBA, you know, you're throwing out, you know, these major uh, contracts out and maybe there's some, some satisfaction. Maybe there's a step back from some players. Maybe it's not as important. Maybe they're playing for the wrong reasons, but you know, for me personally, like if I didn't have it, a a certain drive, a certain confidence, a belief in myself or that will, I would have never even came close to making it because there's a, there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of guys that are probably more talented, more athletic. So if I didn't have that, there's, you know, I probably would never played at Marquette. Um, So I could never have lost that or I would have been, you know, not nearly the player I I was. I think a lot of guys can get by being, you know, six, seven athletic and that can get them so far. Now they'll be capped off. There'll be a ceiling to how good they can be if they don't have that work ethic. But, you know, you can see it all. You you see guys that are NBA Hall of Famers because they have that work ethic. Yeah, they're talented, but like you can you can say, you know, LeBron James is the greatest athletic freak of all time, but you know, LeBron knows how to play basketball and I'm in, you know, I don't, I haven't seen it personally, but I, I bet a lot of money that he's an incredible work ethic. Like you don't just fall into the category of being great by pure uh, talent. You know, there's a lot that goes into all that. I always say to, to get into pro basketball was takes a certain level of work ethic. And then to stay in pro basketball takes like another level So when we talk about a guy like LeBron, who's doing it, what is he, 38 right now? Is he 30? 30, He's like high 30s. He's something like that. And and he's still doing it consistently. I always thought that was crazy. I will go into overseas basketball because that, I think, is is equally as tough. Because there's constantly, you're constantly fighting and there's only a a few slots available to and the young guys are constantly coming and, and the hype is there. So it's really hard to, to maintain, which brings me into the craziest thing I've ever heard. And I don't think I've ever heard of anyone else besides you, Travis. I'm being dead serious. I, I was online researching this week to see if I could find another American who's gone through this. You had your jersey retired by an Italian team, which is, as an American, I know you had dual citizenship, but... As an American, I think that might be the greatest accomplishment I've ever heard of. You got your reti- jersey retired in a foreign country. And overseas basketball, we talk about this a lot in the show. There's you only most contracts are year to year. So for your ability to stick around for multiple years at one club, let alone get your jersey retired, was that something where you're like, holy shit, like 
th- to me, when I heard that, I was blown away. That was probably the most impressive stat I've ever heard of overseas basketball, someone getting their jersey retired. Was that something that you were just like, oh, this is this is incredible? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head and you've spent time playing over there, so you kind of understand it. And you, you alluded to that, that, you know, Americans don't stay in one city or one team for a long time. So it's hard for them to accumulate, you know, whatever it is, uh, awards, team awards, statistics, whatever the qualifications are to get your number retired. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to, and I'm a, I'm a pretty loyal guy. And so the, the, I had other opportunities to move on. Cause when I got to the club, I was at, it was a very small club, but we built it up and we kept winning and winning. And obviously winning has a lot to do with your credentials. And so to stay there and f- for four years, have the same coach, I think is very unusual for Americans. And that's, and that's what you said. And, and so when, when it happened, you know, I was, maybe I was, naive to just how special it was but it was something that you know will remain with me forever just because i know it is unusual Uh, it's unusual to stay in in a city for four years as an american it's an unusual to go from you know first the first year with this club was the first year in the first division and four years later we had qualified for euro league so that's a ginormous step if you understand european basketball it doesn't happen ever and so like I know we accomplished great things and obviously it was a lot more than just me. We had a great coach. I had great teammates and, you know, John, you know, talks about that in the book and some of my former teammates. Uh, So it was, uh, it was a special four years. And I think a lot of those things that we accomplished as a team is, is why. And and then, you know, and you're overseas and and you're making yourself uh, available to the fans and the people and you're out in the city and you're, you're adapting to the culture and you're not just sitting as an American. A lot of Americans will go over there and just sit in their apartment and play video games. Cause there's so much downtime, but you know, I was out and about and people saw me and people, I mean, tried to talk to me. It wasn't, you know, the language barrier was, was there, but you know, to, to get ingrained in the culture uh, I think meant a lot to the people. And so the people had a certain feeling towards me and my family that uh, ultimately led to, you know, maybe heightened, uh accolades or adulation i i know when i was in australia you know same same kind of thing i went to south korea to chase money like an idiot and i should have just stayed in australia because i had an offer for the next year and a lot of guys end up that i played with are currently still in australia they've met you know spouses over there they've stayed over there they're raising their family over there was that something you know you met your wife in italy was that something that you ever considered were you just like maybe i'll stay here for the rest of my life was that ever a thought where you're like now like i like where i came from because that is definitely uh one of those conundrums that overseas athletes face stay or go yeah no i mean i well i met my wife at at marquette she's italian both her parents were, were born in italy uh so you know when i decided to to leave the nba to go overseas there was a couple countries that uh, we wanted to go to and it was either you know it was it was Italy Spain Germany were the three that uh, intrigued me and my wife uh, and once I got to Italy like like I said once you <clears throat> I think overseas basketball is hard you know it's it's a lot of time away from what you're used to and you know it's not as you know it's a lot of practices not a lot of games um, you're in a different country so you know once I found the and I found it right away. I found a place that I was truly comfortable and happy. And I found a coach that would let me play to, I think my strengths, you know, these other offers, you know, there was more money and all that. I just, you know, in the, in the back of my mind is like, I don't know if the grass grass is greener and maybe it would have been, but I had an incredible four years there. Uh, so I'm happy. I was ha- extremely happy with that decision. And, you know, that led to all this, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, you become loyal to a certain city, a certain region that isn't used to having success uh, on the basketball court. Uh, you know, that that stays with you forever. Last kind of question about playing, because I know this is a a huge thing that comes up. You left uh, playing professionally. You went into coaching for a little bit and then you went back. That is something that many athletes have done. They've gone in, they've been like, all right, let's, I think I'm done. 
let me get into coaching. What influenced that decision to kind of say, I still got it? Was it just watching practices or were you just kind of like working out still and being like, I can still, I can still do this. What led to that decision to be like, I'm still, I'm still that guy. Yeah. I, th I think it was, you know, you, you, you see you, you're there in practices and you're watching high level college basketball on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, you're still, I'm still in shape. I'm still playing. I'm, I'm in recreational shape. I'm not in professional basketball shape. And yeah. I, don't, I, I never intended to retire uh fully you know I, I like we said the overseas life is hard and i had, i had gone pretty much two years without ever being home because of i played in the european championships for italy so you know that summer that's the whole summer pretty much and i we had just had our second child so i was missing some time at home because i was overseas and uh it just became a lot and too much for me mentally and physically i'm like i need a break so initially it was just like i'm gonna take a few months off Maybe Christmas time, I'll sign another contract overseas and I'll go back. And then Marquette came and, and Coach Wojo offered me a job. And then, you know, one year turns into three years. And then at three years, at 35, it's either, okay, like, you got to do this now or, you know, you're done. Like, you're not going back when you're 40. So I just had the itch to play. And I don't know if that ever left me. Uh, I don't know if I ever was all into coaching. And that's not to say I didn't do my best. But, you know, when you're a player and a competitor – uh and you still believe you can play at a high level uh you know that ultimately led back to to italy and and with the same coach for the you know the next three years of my career which were actually probably the most uh satisfying of my life uh just because i got to share it with my family and it was hard it was hard going back and playing and it was a lot harder than i thought it would be and and i guess that's you know when you take three years off and you think you're just going to go in and dominate you know, it takes, it takes some time. I always, I'm always intrigued too. We talked about, you know, ending up living overseas. The, I, I, it's a weird word to use because it's not the word that it's going to sound like offensive to people, but breeding, like we have children because we love and, you know, we have children, but it, I always remembered when I was playing and being like, I want to have a kid when I'm playing in here because then they will be, a citizen of here and that will give them an advantage as they grow up in life was that ever something that you thought of was that that ever that crossed your mind to be like huh well guess what my kids are being born in italy that will give them an advantage if they choose to go down that path is that that ever something because i know my brother my brother's seven foot he married a girl who's six five she was like the big five all-time leading scorer their kids are freaking huge and they're all play basketball and all i think about all the time was like there had to be a thought. I don't ask them because, I mean, that's their business. But I, I was like, there has to be a thought that, like, you're six five, I'm seven foot. Our kids could be great. Let's do this. Like, there has to – I feel like we 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 just marry for love. Like, whatever happened to marry for breeding anymore? I mean, we're trying to create great basketball players. So I always thought that, like, if I, if I was playing overseas and I had my children, was that ever a thought? Be like, this is awesome that they have dual citizenship now. Yeah, I mean, uh, on that side of it, yes, uh, I think it's a, I think it's cool. I think it's a neat experience. I think it's, I think we had an, an incredible experience living overseas, and you know, now that they are all dual citizens, I don't think that can hurt them. Now, did we go into it like we're gonna have? To do it? No, I mean, my wife's a, a five six Italian, so I don't know if the, I mean, she's not six five, so I don't know what the the basketball outlook is, but um, I think more of it was like you know, we, we knew we were going to have a lot of kids and we, we mm -hmm. wanted that. I don't think it mattered where I think the experience that uh, three of my kids got living over there is something that even though they were young, it's, it's certain things they'll never forget. And I think it's uh, to give your kids, uh, you know, experiences that I never thought would ever come, come to me. I mean, I, I grew up in Fond du Lac. I mean, and I never thought I'd play basketball overseas. I, I didn't even know that was an option growing up. And then you find yourself, you know, playing basketball in these foreign countries and you're learning about different types of people. You're learning the different cultures and, and how they live and eat and breathe and, you know, go about their way. And it's uh, I think it's very valuable. I think it's it's experiences like that that you can try to give your kids that, you know, that we have given our kids that, you know, ultimately lead them to a path that they can find some passion in life. Let's go back to America now. 
John, you know, the walk-on warrior, it's a great look at what it takes to be a D1 walk-on. You've really tell the story and take you through. Uh, and then No Fear in the Arena takes us, you know, through Travis's path. Uh, both kind of share that similar theme of drive, of what it takes to make make it on that level. And both of you are kind of from, you know, similar area. You're from the Midwest. I'm from Philadelphia. We There's always that area that kind of has a certain type of player like philly we were just like all right well you know my dad if if i wasn't playing well he'd be like you know yelling at me and telling me i'm not tough enough and things that was like always the philly mentality midwest has that like you are going to you will work and work and work and you will succeed if you just put in the work there's like that blue collar like hard working we're going to sit there and shoot the ball. I mean, shoot the ball in the middle of the winter. Your hands are frozen. Just giving that maximum effort. Uh, is there something about the Midwest that kind of creates that drive where you're just, and you guys can both kind of feel this one, that creates that drive to be successful? I mean, I can speak to it just so after I was done playing, I I moved all over the country. I lived in Newport Beach, California. I lived in parts of Los Angeles. I was in Utah. I was in Portland, Oregon, Chicago. Um, and I coached youth basketball in a lot of these cities. And not to like talk down on maybe some of the the kids I coached in California, but there was a huge difference. Um, and I think a lot of it is, you know, when it's 75 and sunny, 365 days a year, uh, you got a lot of other options. So like for me to want to go and put in extra time in the gym, so like, no. And I like we I was coaching this AAU team in Orange County and we went to this big tournament and we played the Compton Magic and we got absolutely just blown out. It was so embarrassing to me as like the coach because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to be associated with it, to be frank, um, versus the opposite is I had coached youth teams uh, in Wisconsin and Chicago, both where, yeah, the kids just different mentality you know like the games were always close because they wanted to make them close and they competed kind of right to the to the whistle so i do think there's a there's a mentality a lot of it comes down to the parents and just the way that some of these kids are are raised but um it was interesting kind of seeing it uh as a coach with some of these young kids it is i've done stuff in other areas as well and it's you know you have it's just there there's certain areas that have that that drive. I always talk about Philadelphia fans and you know people hate Philadelphia fans. And while, you know, there's there's no acceptable reasoning behind some of their antics uh or our antics, there is a lot of just like such a passion for sport here. It's like you it's it's people's lives. And it's weird because I don't really you know Travis we we'll talk you know a little bit more about you know NBA and stuff like I never really fanboyed out when I when I was like holy shit like I can't believe I remember uh with LeBron my brother was in camp uh with the Cavs when I was in college and I went and you know met LeBron and stuff and I would just remember being like cool like you do what I do like this isn't anything crazy but Miles Teller I went to the World Series and Miles Teller was sitting like two seats over from me and I was like, holy shit, it's like the guy from Top Gun. Like that, it's weird because I get more excited by things like that. I never got excited by, you know, basketball players because we all kind of did that same thing. Uh, but kind of going into that whole entire, uh, when you were, I guess like, I want to get your opinion first on what you think kind of makes that Midwestern player so great. And then we'll kind of travel into that venture. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think John hit the nail on the head. And I think, you know, I think it's I think it can be very similar between the Midwest and Philly. I've always had a, a great deal of respect. And I, I played with, you know, Jameer Nelson and, and mm -hmm. in Orlando. And, you know, he was tough and uh, he's exactly what you'd want in a basketball player. And I think a lot of the the Philly mentality is is to work hard. And, you know, your experience with your father was, you know, very similar to my experience with my father. It was, you know, you're going to play hard. You're going to you know, if you're not, then, you know, I was going to hear it. And, 
Uh, I think a lot of it is ingrained in, in how you grow up and the situations and the people you're around. And uh, obviously with it being cold and snowy and, and not much else to do, you're going to find yourself in a gym a lot of the times. And naturally, naturally at a young age, if you're in the gym doing whatever you want, you're going to get better. Yeah. It doesn't, you don't need to be like, you don't need a trainer or someone to tell you exactly what you do. But if you're just in there getting shots up or dribbling, even if you're just playing around with your friends for hours at a time, you're going to naturally get better quick, especially at a young age. You know, my parents would drop me off at the the YMCA at eight in the morning and they'd come and pick me up at five in the afternoon. And I wasn't playing basketball the whole time, but it could be, you know, I'm running around the tennis courts, I'm in the racquetball courts, I'm playing basketball, but you're just hanging with your friends and, and naturally over time, you're going to get better. And then you develop that passion where, you know, you can get better and you can get coached hard because you love the, you love the game. And I, I've loved the game ever since I was a little kid. So that didn't develop late, but like, I've always wanted to be in the gym. I've wanted to be outside playing basketball and uh, I was pushed pretty hard by my, my parents to, you know, to, to, to do what I wanted. But if you're going to do it, you're going to do it hard. And if not, then you're going to find something else to do. And so I think that mentality is is ingrained in a lot of kids and in, in where I come from. Uh, I can't speak for, you know, a kid that grows up in, you know, Los Angeles or Texas and, and what's going through their mind or or how, how they're, you know, brought up through their family. But for me, it was, it was uh, you know, we're going to play sports, we're going to do it hard, and, and we're going to have fun doing it. I think uh, not to get all dead – dead talk on you guys but i do think when i look at what same similar reasoning behind i never had a trainer or anything like that i just went and me and my brother would just play and just get you know go to the courts uh by our house and just get our asses kicked and play and play and play and you just kind of got better and you started loving the game and you started wanting to compete there is such an emphasis on training now and obviously you know coaching both you guys know that emphasis on training and not that the the game is 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 any different but do you think that the passion is diminishing a little bit do you think that passion and love for the game or is it becoming like robotic where guys are just like i need to do this i need to go to this trainer because that's what i'm noticing with even the young high school players that i work with they're very robotic in terms of like they there's they like playing and they like being the star but there's not that like love of the game that I feel like we had growing up because we just were around it and we're just playing it and there was no one sitting there like you have this regimented schedule it just became fun like you said being at the YMCA for hours that I'm like living through that and thinking about my childhood and just going to places and just playing and just doing whatever and not playing basketball the whole time but just playing and that's not really as much of a thing these days. Do you think that's killing the passion or do you think it's still there? Well, yeah, I mean, those are good points. I mean, I, like I said, you just found a way. I mean, I found a way and, and my friends found a way just to organize basketball games, pickup games where you just play mm -hmm. it. I, I mean, I grew up playing against my older cousins and my older uncles. And, you know, at that point, when I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, I'm by far the worst player on the court and I'm getting my ass kicked. I'm getting yelled at. And that makes you want – that's either makes you want to quit and not play because it's not very fun, or it makes you want to get better and to prove that at some point in your life you'll be you'll be able to play in those types of games. And so, uh, you know, I train a lot of kids, and I, I don't – I don't – I think I agree with you that it's, it's hard because these kids nowadays are more skilled than any other generation ever. I mean, they are incredible shooters. They shoot with range, the, the ball handling, everything. But like you said, it is very robotic because they don't play. And, you know, you you have to be able to make decisions. You got to be have a high basketball IQ. And that comes with playing and competing. So I don't I think the passion is still is still there. I just don't know if the the love of competition is there anymore because I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think there's much competing. And so when you're not organizing pickup games, you're playing two on two, three on three which teaches you a lot how to play and compete. And then you, you get in these scenarios where, yeah, th these guys look great. I mean, I can work a kid out and he looks, gosh, this kid's the greatest player ever. You put him in a game and it's like, well, that doesn't translate at all. So what are you going to do when you have defense? What are you going to do when you get punched in the mouth? 
when you drive, can you make a decision? Can you pass? Uh, so that's the thing I've seen the most is like, and I, and with my workouts and the people I'm training, it's more about a mentality. Uh huh. It's, it's, you know, you're going to, I'm going to push you to a certain point. Can you deal with that? Can you deal with adversity? Cause I think that's the one thing I think that basketball has taught me the most is, is you are going to get hit. You're going to have to deal with a lot of adversity, especially if you want to make it, uh, if you, if you want to have a long career. So I try to get them to a point where maybe they don't want to be there and then we'll see exactly how much you really want to be there. I think the, the, the biggest takeaway, I, I love the, the aspect of when you, you look at some of these drills, like these kids definitely have way more skill, but just those nuances of the game. I remember talking to a kid who I was working with, uh, you know, on my team, and I'm like, you have to go slow, but then you have to go fast. Like you have to know how to finish fa- like methodically and take your time. Like what, like Luca put up absurd numbers last night, but he has a very good way of fast, slow. Like he he'll go fast when he needs to, he'll go slow when he needs to methodically and just teaching that to kids. And they're just like, wait, what do you mean? And you're like, well, you, it's just a weird thing to explain. Cause I think it comes with playing. It's not something that just magically happens. You have to play to know, don't go in here a million miles an hour against a shot blocker and not put your body. He's going to throw it into the stands. They just don't get it because they're just not playing enough. And we played Camden, who's the number one, DJ Wagner. Yep. Uh, we, we played them last week, number one team in the country. And we probably got blocked at least 40 times. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> you have to understand, like, he's a shot blocker. Like, there's things you have, and it's just not enough playing. Like, they just don't do it in the offseason enough. But they, they can shoot. And they can dribble, but it's just like that skill uh, of just awareness is lacking. Like if you made them an NBA 2K, they'd have an awareness of like 30. Like everything yeah, right. else would be high, but their awareness would be down low. Right. So going into uh, playing at Marquette, obviously, Travis, you you have that mentality. You're like, I always i am I'm the best player. And there's been moments where I was like, holy shit, like when I was playing. And I'm like, wow, he just, this guy I'm playing against just did something. I remember playing, we played Duke and it was like the Battier, Dunleavy, Jay Williams. And I remember Jay Williams, I had to go out and guard him on the wing and he just like, and just like hit a three. And I was like, what the hell just happened? I just, it was just so new to me that I didn't even understand that. When playing with Dwayne Wade and going through, was there ever a time when you were just like, wow, that was incredible. Like you saw it. Where you're just like, okay, he's 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 the real deal. Oh yeah, I mean, you could you could watch one or two practices and know he was he was going to be special or he was special, and then then over a course of you know two years, you you kind of take it for granted. Like he, <laughs> you see it every day. It's like okay, like now what now what's next? Like what can you do next to help us win? And Dwayne's greatest attributes were his his really is unselfishness. Like he very rarely like took bad shots. He was, he was all into making his teammates better. He was an incredible passer, had incredible footwork. I think what gets lost and how good he was, was he had kind of this old school game. Yeah. He was really, he was a good athlete, but he wasn't a free, he was really long. Like he had a over seven foot wingspan, but he was only six, three. And, but he used the backboard. Kids don't use the backboard anymore, but he had these good, you know, floaters, jump hooks, like an old school type of game. But, you know, you saw it on a daily basis that this kid was, you know, not only, you know, one of the best players in college basketball, but he had a chance to have a a good NBA career. Now, I don't think any of us would have predicted he'd be a, you know, a top 25 player of all time. But, you know, you go back to those intangibles that you really can't teach. And he had them. And, you know, to, to get to that level, you have to have something inside you. You have to have an ability to, to uh, coexist with players. I mean, he, he took LeBron. He had no issue. Hey, LeBron, come down to Miami. I'll be, and this is Dwayne was the MVP of the finals years before that. Like he was one of the best players in the NBA. He's like, no, LeBron come, I'll take a back seat as long as we have a chance to win more championships. And that's what happened. And, And he's always had that, that, you know, that unselfishness, he's genuine, get humility. And, you know, that's why he won, you know, three championships and, and is one of the greatest, you know, to ever play the game. You're right. The, the, he, the intangibles are something that you don't really, because there's players that you kind of play against and you're like, oh, wow, he really took off. 
And then you look back and you're like, well, he was able to do this, this, this. Maybe he wasn't on that level, but he worked his way to that level. So I always love those stories of kind of like the superstars before they were superstars. Like, what were they able to do? I remember watching, Le like, when I was talking about LeBron and uh, when I'm, I'm from the Philadelphia area and I played against Kobe and like some, be, this is, I mean, you guys probably grew up in a little bit, like I'm 42 now. But AU was starting to take off when I was going, but it really wasn't a thing yet. So we played in like little, we played in like these, the Sunny Hill League, which was a Philadelphia based league. And I ended up playing with my brother's team and we played against Kobe. I had no idea who Kobe was. And he was, he, I just remember his, his tenacity. Like he was just a maniac. Like he would have eaten my soul. And at the time, I was kind of like, I was like a freshman in high school with like a big baggy uniform I was so skinny I was just still trying to figure out what basketball was and he would like wanted to just destroy me and that was that first time where I was like whoa like he had that mentality and obviously got grew into his body got better and better and better but it's that was the first time really seeing seeing someone like that when you're talking about those intangibles and he had them just like that that he had that mentality like I'm going to destroy you even if I can't do everything yet there's going to be a time when I can, and I love that. Uh, so, John, let's get back to the book. Uh, no fear in the arena. Take us through. Give the give the listeners. I almost said readers. Obviously, future readers, but listeners, a little glimpse uh, and where we can purchase this book and where we can get it. And yes. walk on water, by the way. Let's get all of your stuff. Let's let's <laughs> sell it all out. Both books are available on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble as well. But I think um, these these books, you know, sometimes I, I ask myself, like, what do I want to do with my life? You know, and um, I think maybe that's like midlife crisis. It's what happens when you have kids. But, you know, when I wrote the first one, it's like I really enjoy doing this. And I enjoy telling real stories about real people that to me, like have done some fascinating things. And I think you asked me like right at the beginning, like I was mowing my grass in the backyard three summers ago. And then I reached out to Travis afterwards and was like, I have this idea for this book. What do you think about it? You know, am I totally crazy? And that's kind of whole, how the whole thing started. Um, the reason I think no fear in the arena is, is awesome. is just because, you know, it's one thing to write your own book and everything's in your brain. And, you know, you, you tell these stories but it's another thing when you interview 25, 30 people and you hear them like the joy, the sadness, the, I can't believe this happened this way. Um, it's just, it makes for some unbelievable content. And, you know, there's a story in there from, from one of Travis's teammates in Italy um, from a game in, in Belgrade, Serbia. And it's one of my favorites from the book where playing in, in Belgrade, hostile environment. I think it was Travis comes down, hits a shot right before the half. So it's halftime. I believe the game is tied. And all of a sudden the fans just start raining down stuff from the crowd. Um, anything they could find is thrown on the court. And, you know, Travis's coach and teammates are running towards the tunnel and it's like, get over here. Let's, you know, and, you know, Travis is so in the moment, basically, whether he's yelling at the fans or just yelling himself, but just basically standing at midcourt and you have this like vision of what this is and this just chaos where half these guys are like, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then there's this guy standing out there just like in his own, you know, mind space. And I think that kind of sums up just the, the mentality, I think, that runs through this book is here was a guy that loved to play the game. He loved that hostility. He loved to play in environments where it actually mattered. And ultimately, you know, as the writer, it's like, how do we bring this through and, and kind of bring people there? So that's what we tried to accomplish. That's a great story. The Because if you've ever been there, if you played overseas, you know that story. You know people throwing stuff on the court. And as an American, and as that kind of mentality you're like you're like what are you doing you're yelling at the crowd i remember the same situation like a guy had to come over and he's like kevin 
the fuck off the court. And I was like, oh shit, like what? He's like, there's thousands of them and there's one of you. Get the fuck off the court. And I remember that was that first time. And after that, I was like, all right, I'm getting the fuck off the court. Like every time they started throwing stuff, I'm like, all right, see you guys. Uh, but that's a great story because it really does show Travis like your tenacity and being like we're playing a game and I'm here to win and you're gonna get involved now you're now you're now you're bringing it to me and now you're involved and I love that mentality that's incredible and kind of into that mentality uh the basketball tournament is awesome I remember when it started they wanted they uh, the guy one of the organizers called me and was like hey can you put a team together because I went to Camden Catholic which is like a big school in the Jersey area it's like can you put an alumni team together I was like sure and we put it together and then we had to like do all the social media stuff. I had no idea what I was doing. So we didn't get in needless to say, but I remember I watched it every year. Travis, when you hit that shot to win a million dollars for your team and uh, was it the golden Eagles, right? So you hit that shot. Was there ever part of you? Cause you guys split a million dollars. Was there ever part you're like, all right, Someone's got someone's got to up the ante. <laughs> like, give me give me a little bit extra of my cut because none of y'all would have any money if it wasn't for me. It was... Well, it was the only shot I hit in the game. So, <laughs> uh, no, it was. Uh, you know, it was just one of those moments that, you know, it it was, it was like the very first time in my career I actually like went into a game and I felt like a certain sense of calm and I I I knew we were gonna win. And I never had that feeling before. And it sounds maybe corny, but it was like we lost the year before in the championship for two million. Uh, and then fast forward, we're in the bubble. It's it's COVID. It's the first thing that's on TV. And uh, there's some uh, there's a lot of people watching. But the night before the game, and we had a team meeting, and I just I felt an incredible sense of calm that we were going to win the game. That it was our time. That we deserved it. Uh, and, you know, I felt that during the game and, and it came down to the wire. And fortunately for, for us, I, you know, got a wide open shot. It was a great pass from Elgin and, you know, you know, made it. And it's just another, another moment that uh, was very special to me, maybe more so than, you know, the game wasn't, you know, the most important game I ever played in. And, and I get it. It's a summer tournament. Uh, you can win a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. Is it, mean a lot I, I don't know but you know my my family my kids got to see it and they got to see me play and and they were a little older so that's what really resonated with me is is you know obviously they couldn't be there but the phone call after the game and how excited they were in the videos uh of my dad who they had videos of my dad they had uh, my wife had videos of my kids that's what made it most memorable for me because you know when you're younger you know when I when we went to the final four it's like you think that that's, it's normal. Like, gosh, this is easy. Like you, you take it for granted. And I knew that that moment, that shot, uh, you know, might be the last time I ever, uh, that they ever get to see me play or do something incredible. So it, it took on a different meaning for me than all the stuff that it had accomplished up to them because it back then it felt more of just, okay, it's just me. I'm just enjoying it. Like, you know, my family obviously enjoyed it all, but it's like, you know, it's just a different type of feeling when you have when you have kids and they can see their dad doing something that he loves, because you hope for your kids that they can find that same passion for something that they want to do later on in life. I love the fan. I, I think that's that's something I actually watch them a lot because it gives you that competitive edge. When you see the fans reaction, because we always take it for granted, we're on the court and it's like, OK, we're here for us, for the team. And your job, especially when you play pro basketball, like you're you're getting paid to win games for you and your team and the owner and this, you forget a ton about the fans. So when you see those fans' perspective, like your kids and your wife and your dad and like all the reactions to you hitting that shot, which were all over the internet, it's such a it's a it's such a feel good story. You kind of you you sit back and you're like, that's why you do it, and you kind of forget for a long time. You think you're doing it for you, but you are, but when you see those reactions, it becomes, wow, I'm also doing this for them. And look at their excitement. Phillies, I'm a huge Phillies fan. So just watching those reactions, Stephen Bryce Harper's home run. I hope no one's like a Padres fan or anything. But uh, those reactions, I remember just being like, man, like this is 
46,000 people were screaming and jumping up and down because one person did it. And it, as an athlete, if you can watch that, we didn't, I didn't have that at a young age. So like I just assumed fans were, you know, making fun of me for being skinny or stupid or something when I played. So I didn't have the reactions of them doing things. So as a young athlete, I think that's cool to be able to see why you're doing this and who you're doing this for along with yourself. And that's a great takeaway that I always bring to athletes. Like, listen, like look at these people. They're here because of you. And I think that's just such an incredible thing. So when you hit that shot and see those reactions, it was, that's, that's a heartwarming feeling. And especially your kids, man, my, my daughter, I try to convince her I played basketball. She's like, dad, you're just tall. I'm like, cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's my, I mean, I can't tell my kids anything about basketball. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's funny that, you know, you can do something and, you know, in their eyes, you're just, you're their dad, you know, and, and basketball is second in which it should be. And it's great. Um, but, you know, like you said, like, you don't realize, I think until you like, now I start going back and, and going to like Marquette basketball games and, and seeing the passion in the stands, like you're sitting in the stands and you see just kind of what it means to people. Like you don't understand. I, I don't think I, I quite understood exactly the meaning that it took on for a lot of these people that come and watch and support. They went to school here, you know, it, Marquette means a lot to them or, you know, overseas or whatever fans in general, it's like, yeah, this means a lot. And I think you take it for granted sometimes as an athlete, because you are doing it because it is your job. It is what you've done. You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your family, but to see kind of, to have people come up to you and talk to you about moments where they were in their life or, you know, we, this is what I was doing when we, you guys were going to the final four, you know, I saw you hit that shot uh, in TBT, you know, that meant a lot. It's awesome. You know, it makes you feel good about, I think it makes me feel good about how I represented, you know, the university, how I represented myself. And I think the older you get, you know, you, you get humbled through all those experiences, through those people coming and talking to you because you know just how much it meant to not only just to myself, which obviously it, it's it was incredible career I've had, but to all these other people. Well, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you guys hopping on today, uh, being able to give up some of your time to talk a little bit about this. I thought there's a lot about you know just the mentality, the athlete's mentality, and a lot of what it takes, along with those kind of heartwarming stories. Uh, John, Travis, I thank you so much. Everyone go buy No Fear in the Arena and go buy Walk on Warrior. Uh, two great titles by John who, you know, give those a read this holiday season. No one's doing anything right now. Stop lying. Uh, go get those. Uh, Travis, John, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It was a lot of fun and I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Kevin. This has been the Overseas Famous Podcast sponsored by Luke Mogul with Travis, John, and myself, Kevin. Oh.